Welcome to the opening of the academic year of the Eindhoven University of Technology. Special word of welcome to the ones who join us online, because this event is web streamed. And of course, a special word of welcome to those who are today with us here in the Blue Hall, celebrating the opening of the academic year. And it's a special opening of the academic year, because the TUE is celebrating its 65th anniversary. And for that reason, we have invited two very impressive speakers, who will be later on introduced by Barry Fitzgerald, our host for today. My name is Robert John Smits, I'm the president of the Eindhoven University of Technology, and once again, welcome to all of you. There's not just this opening, there are not just these two brilliant lectures we are going to hear, but there's also the inauguration of our fourth institute, which will be focusing on quantum and photonics. And also there, we have special invitees who will perform the opening and inauguration act. Before I hand over to Barry Fitzgerald, our host for today, I would like to briefly bring you back to the summer, to the Olympic Games in Tokyo. Because the TUE, our university, was very successful there. We had Lisa Schenaert, who won a bronze medal in the women's double skulls rowing, and you see her here. And we have Santa de Graaf, who was a finalist in the men's four. And I would like to give them a big hand, because this was just amazing. <laughs> but if you think that was all that our university did in Tokyo during the Olympic Games, you're wrong. Because what do gold and silver medalists Primoz Roglic, Tom Dumoulin, Wout van Aert and a couple of others have in common? They all came to our wind tunnel to work on the aerodynamics. And that paid off. And only this very weekend, the last weekend, the Irish paracyclist team from Dublin, from Galway, won their second gold medal. And also they came to the wind tunnel of the TOE to work on the aerodynamics. And that's why I would like to put the spotlight as well on Professor Bert Blocken, who is running our wind tunnel. And if I'm not mistaken, he's on screen. Bert, we are extremely proud of you. And these medals, be them gold, silver or bronze, also are partly because of your enormous effort. And if you think that Professor Blocken only works in his wind tunnel with cyclists, you're wrong. Professor Blocke did outstanding and pioneering research on aerosols in the context of the COVID-19 crisis. So we are extremely proud of this very impressive professor of our university. And now I hand over to Barry. The floor is yours. Thank you very much to Robert Jan Smith, President of Eindhoven University of Technology. So I am your host for today, the host for the opening of the academic year 2021-2022. And I'd just like to, to, to borrow a little bit of what Robert Jan Smith said. I have to say it's fantastic to see the involvement of Bert Blocke with the Paralympic athletes from Ireland, because you might have guessed it, I'm from Ireland. So very, very happy to see such a link between the university where I'm working and our Paralympic athletes. You're very welcome to this opening of the academic year. We have a packed program for you. We have inspiring keynote speakers. We have the launch of a new institute. We have some more guests and surprises along the way. So let's get started almost instantaneously with our first keynote speaker. She is the president of the Dutch business community. Please give a very warm welcome to the stage to Ingrid Tyson. Hi. Very welcome to the stage. Thank you for being here today. The floor is yours, Ingrid. Well, thank you very much. Well, my dear audience, it's an honor to be here, of course, today. And, um, well, I was so pleased to see here around all the students back live on your campus again. That has, well, has been a while, more than uh, one and a half years. 
And it's a special day for me as well, and for my husband, who's also here, because our youngest started his studies, not in Eindhoven, but <laughs> on university. So it's a special day. And it's also a special day for Eindhoven University of Technology. So, Eindhoven, city of daring deeds. That was the catchphrase at the birth of your, of, of your university. 65 years ago, in 1956. Well, and now here we are. You have developed into a world-class university. You are the main supplier of highly skilled engineers for the, the Brainport community. And of course, you are also a highly esteemed research partner for numerous companies. So it's really an honor to be here. And I have a confession to make, and that is that I am not an engineer. But I do have a sweet spot for technology. I have a vivid memory when I was about 14 years old, and I see you thinking that is some time ago. Yes, true. But I was uh, traveling on a Tiener Tour cart. I know Dutch people in the room know the Tiener Tour. Well, I was traveling with my best friend, Karin. And, um, oh, I forgot my first slide, sorry. This is back in 1956, of course, then Eindhoven. And, well, here is my best friend, Karin, and me, about around 14 years old. Um, and with this Tiener tour, we visited the Evoluon. You all know the Evoluon. And I really remember how impressed I was. How impressed I was, of course, first because of the UFO-shaped building it is, um, but of course also because of the wonders of technology that were demonstrated inside, like radar, I remember, and satellite, and I don't know if you recall those, there was some kind of red tubes at the entrance. It had something to do with, with ticket counting or something. Um, well, I think that was a demonstration, of course, that Eindhoven and the region is a center of technology and has been for dec decades, maybe even a century. So, I have a sweet spot for technology and I'm also a true European. And that is why I would like to combine those two and speak to you about the relevance of technology for Europe. But first, the relevance of Europe as such. And that is, of course, as you are all aware, first, that the European Union has brought us peace, has brought peace to our continent after centuries of devastating wars. And of course, for the Netherlands especially also, the internal market is very, very relevant. We earn over 30% of our GDP abroad and around 85% of it within Europe. So it's extremely relevant for the Netherlands. And well, of course, we also, as Europeans, share fundamental values. And the reason that I'm mentioning this, although I'm certainly preaching to the converted, is that the relevance of Europe is questioned in the Netherlands time and time again. So I take every opportunity especially on a stage, to talk about it. Well, but next to these reasons why Europe is so important for us, I think there's another reason, a relatively new one. And that is, of course, the new geopolitical reality. The new geopolitical reality in which we are, well, going to a world order, an international order, where power play and economic coercion replaces our rule-based society that we had built internationally in, well, around a century. And I think, um, well, you already experienced this here in your Brainport region. For example, ASML has a problem with exporting its EUV machines to China just because the US government but puts pressure on the Dutch government. So I think you will all agree with me 
that this new geopolitical reality makes a strong Europe even more important. Even more important. And well, what is a strong Europe? That's a Europe that is autonomous, meaning not being vulnerable to economic coercion or power play, but also not choosing protectionism as an answer. So what should Europe do? First, of course, renew our alliances. Renew our alliances with like-minded countries, like Japan, like, of course, the United Kingdom, with Australia, and, of course, also Canada. It's really unbelievable that, well, today, we're even questioning whether we should sign a bilateral trade agreement with Canada. I really can't believe it. Second, Europe should try and use its influence to restore the World Trade Organization, so the rules-based rules society internationally. Then, like I mentioned, the CETA trade agreement, Canada, the European Union needs to seal the deal on trade agreements, bilateral trade agreements. Well, and last but not, not least, of course, Europe has to be more scrutinous. More scrutinous about foreign investments in vital companies and vital infrastructure. But, ladies and gentlemen, this all we not, will not be enough. It will not be enough to really become autonomous. Because for autonomy, there needs to be a situation of mutual interdependence in which other countries are as dependent on you as you are on them. And since we are in the middle of a new industrial revolution, a country's or a continent's position in the key to technologies for future competitiveness will decide who's dependent on whom. And well, the inconvenient truth is that Europe well, does have some strength in some areas of technology, but also is at risk of lagging behind, of falling behind in others. And that's why the European Union identified 12 key technologies. And here I would like to do a little exercise with you. Can you name me some of those 12 key technologies for future competitiveness of a country or, in Europe's case, a continent? Who dares? Quantum, I heard. Battery technology, yeah. Agriculture, artificial intelligence, yes. Well, ideas all over the place, thank you. And now another question. In how many of those 12 did uh, Europe analyze that Europe is leading in the world? How many? No, it's not that bad, not none. <laughs> but I heard, I heard three. I don't know who said, yeah, well, bingo. Um, Europe is only leading in three. And that is in Internet of Things, in mobility, and in advanced manufacturing. And well, this is a big compliment to you, really, because this is at the heart of the expertise of the Brainport community. And for example, you have here in the region a very cool company that is Additive Industries. And well, who watched, well, who did not watch Max Verstappen yesterday? Nobody dares to raise his hand. <laughs> oh, you did? No. <laughs> Well, weren't we proud? Weren't we proud? Well, yeah, uh, yeah <laughs> we were. <laughs> and one of uh, Max's competitors, uh, Kimi Raikkonen, well, he, had, he was sent home. He couldn't compete because uh, he tested positive on COVID-19. But normally, he drives an Alfa Romeo car. And this Alfa Romeo car contains over 300 parts that are printed by additive industries. They are specialized in 3D printing. 
well, but an ex excellent example of advanced manufacturing. Well, so Europe needs to become leading the world in more than three key technologies. It's only three now. So what should Europe do to achieve that? Well, in the first place, I think that we, Europe, we have to put our money where our mouth is. Cutting edge technology, leading the world, that won't come cheap. But losing the geopolitical game will really be expensive. So, well, we are as Dutchmen, unfortunately, not doing very well in this regard. We spend only around 2% of our GDP on research and development. And other advanced economies, they spend at least around 3%. So, public and private, we have to step up and spend more. But there is one exception in the Netherlands, where over 3% of GDP is spent on innovation, on R&D. And that is North Brabant. It's the only province in the Netherlands that spends over 3%. So again, it's going to be boring. <laughs> again, a compliment to this region. Well, putting your money where your mouth is. Second, and that's maybe a bit, well, difficult in an egalitarian society like we are, is I think we should, should choose for excellence. Well, spreading out the money to, so that everybody gets his share won't get us to the top. It's just a recipe for mediocrity. Third, we need more cooperation, cohesion amongst member states within the European framework. Today, every member state of the Euro European Union has its own AI strategy. Well, how useful is that? And well, it might be a bit controversial, but we might even consider to put the funds for fundamental research together on a European level. Well, and I don't think you have to worry then, because when you combine both choosing for excellence and teaming up these funds on a European level, well, you and I know where that money would go. So, another thing that the European Union has to do is we have to get better at scaling up. Nowadays, when there's one unicorn in Europe, there are four in China and eight in the United States. And only, again, in advanced manufacturing, the investments in scaling up of Europe exceed that of the United States. And ladies and gentlemen, we should ensure ensure that we produce what we invent. So that we do not only produce intellectual property and leave the production to others. And again, an example from this region, and that's Lightyear. You're very, also a very cool company that was founded by alumni of your university. They developed the long-range solar car but the production facility is going to be built in Finland. Well, happily, that's in Europe. But the Netherlands really missed the chance. And why? Because the Finnish government, they decided to join a 14 billion European project to build an industry for batteries. And the Dutch government didn't. So, Europe needs to do four things putting our money where our mouth is, choose for excellence, more cooperation, and scaling up. But I think there's one thing even more important that Europe needs. Europe needs you. Europe needs more brain parts. Because, like I mentioned, you are, I could say, the engine of the key technologies that are where Europe is already leading the world. So you have the recipe, you know how to do that, we need more. We need more of those technologies. 
And I think we all know what your recipe is. In the first place, of course, world-class research and development, but also, of course, your ecosystem. Your ecosystem of large and small and medium enterprises, government, university, startups, and all the other educational institutions. That's really your, your secret. So you, Rainport, University of Technology, you keep, a you keep a secret that is of strategic relevance for Europe. So I was wondering, how well known is that? And I did some research, and you might not like me mentioning it, but I got the impression that it's not that well known. So if I'm right, that would really be a pity. It would be a pity because, well, to summarize, Europe needs to become world leading in more key technologies that are relevant for future compet competitiveness. And you here in Eindhoven, you know how to do that. So we need you. So my call upon you today is to dare to think bigger, dare to lead the way. Well, and I hope in five years' time, when you're celebrating your 75th anniversary, now your 70th anniversary, that you will invite me back. And then I will tell you, I hope, that we are not speaking about Brainport Eindhoven, but that we are speaking about Brainport Netherlands. And I hope that in 10 years' time, on your 80th anniversary, you will invite my successor. And my dream is, my dream is that she then will tell you that the world is not talking about Brainport Eindhoven, not about Brainport Netherlands, but about Brainport Europe. Well, with this challenge for you in mind, I wish you a very joyful anniversary and, of course, an excellent new academic year. Thank you. Thank you, Ingrid, for that very inspiring keynote. Can I ask you to just take a seat just here? And I'll have a very quick chat with you before we move on to our second keynote. Now, I just want to add that when you ask the question, yeah. who didn't see Max Verstappen win yesterday? To your left, I was one of those. I had my hand up. You was? Oh, you I, were. I did not see But you're it. not Dutch. Well, I do like <laughs> Formula One. You know, we have a, a nice history with Eddie, with Eddie Jordan, Eddie Irvine. Um, but I was out enjoying the weather. So, oh, yeah. So okay. it was very nice. So I was one of the small few who didn't see it. Um, thank you for your very inspiring keynote. Now, I have to ask this. In your position, you must play some sort of direct or indirect role in regards to formation of new <laughs> governments, using a, a phrase I'm sure that many people are talking about at the moment. Are you hopeful then that they might listen to your plea for more investments in science and innovation to make things like you just finished with, happen. Yes, well, about the formation, we could, could talk uh, until, I think, uh, maybe uh, next Friday. But, wow. uh, <laughs> but um, it's quite embarrassing what's happening in The Hague at, uh, at this moment and last month. But uh, as to your question that, um, are they going to, well, um, increase the investments in R&D, I think so. I'm rather optimistic. I'm rather optimistic about it. Also because at this moment um, in the formation and in our country, money is not an issue. Uh, and I think we all agree that spending money on education and, and also on the research is a very good thing to do. Um, so I'm rather optimistic. Also because, and that hasn't happened before, in the Kennis Coalition, Coalici uh, expertise coalition. We um, uh, bundled our powers with the universities, uh, research um, uh, institutions, and the business community, and we all advocate for the same. So hopefully it will work. Well, I think we've all got our fingers crossed, if that being the case. Thank you very much for the answer. And we're going to move on to our second keynote speaker, and we're going to go for the other side of 
this important discussion we're going to have later on. That's the academic side. And our second keynote speaker, well, he's the director and Leon Levy professor at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, and he is an international figurehead of science. Please join me in welcoming Robert Dycraft to the stage. Great to have you here, Robert. Wonderful to be here. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Well, uh, congratulations, all of you, on your 65th uh, birthday. Typically, 65 feels, but uh, perhaps not the most exciting age. But I would say it's the it's the new 40, and it's wonderful uh, for you to uh, for me to uh, help kickstart. And also, I must say, to be back into something that vaguely looks like a more normal day. Uh, I don't know about you, but I feel uh, that this feels much more than the opening of the academic year 2020 than 2021. Uh, we all went through uh, what physicists call a closed time-like loop, a little bit like in Groundhog Day, where you keep repeating and repeating. Um, I must say, you know, we are, of course, in exceptional times. Um, the world is going through this global crisis of the pandemic. Uh, this summer, we have seen everywhere the impact of climate change. And I must say, you know, my message of coming through this exceptional period is that science works. Uh, science has delivered. Um, we have seen something pretty remarkable. Um, globalization might be a problem, but globalization works in science. We saw an unprecedented collaboration between scientists, medical doctors, social scientists, um, exchanging ideas, data, theories, and attacking this, this problem. And it's quite remarkable, I think it's estimated, that the total body mass of all the coronaviruses presently on planet Earth is around one kilogram. So it's a very small enemy. And we have seen something like the equivalent of the Manhattan Project, uh, not fighting each other in this case, but fighting a com common enemy. And I think this is something that we uh, should recognize. It's quite remarkable that I'm now standing here and I think most of us are fully vaccinated. Uh, in April 2020, the New York Times had this app, uh, said how long will a vaccine really take? And there were lots of little slides uh, that you could do. And you, the prediction was if nothing changes, we'll have a vaccine by November 2033. And then one thing you could do is you could put all the slides to the most optimistic scenario, which means building a factory before you know what actually this factory will make. Uh, and if you did that, uh, you came to February 2021. The first vaccines were approved in November 2020. The most important slide was at the top, academic research. The premise here was that the scientific knowledge was already known. So the most amazing thing was that the ideas about how to produce such a vaccine were already developed because 30 years before, fundamental research started in that area. We all know uh, the miracle of these messenger RNA viruses. Your body uh, uses RNA as a kind of an instruction to basically build any possible molecule. And the idea of the mRNA revolution is to use your own body as a pharmaceutical factory, producing basically anything, uh, pr uh, perhaps curing cancer, etc. And this was a very long uh, effort that uh, quite remarkably uh, led to success. It's very few occasions that the first technological breakthrough is also the most innovative and afterwards the most effective. Um, that's because of some pioneers. Here's one of them, a uh, Hungarian uh, biochemist, Kati Kariko, who started working on messenger RNA in 1989. She was so focused on her research that she actually was demoted at the University of Pennsylvania because she didn't produce enough. Uh, but together with her collaborator, Drew Weissman, they were able to solve the solution that you can inject the RNA in your body and it is not being rejected, not killed by your immune system. And I love this picture of the two of them receiving the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, and she had tears in her eyes actually on that day when that happened. 
So it's a remarkable success. It's, a, it's one of these instances of what I like to call the usefulness of useless knowledge, uh, which was a, a, a title of an essay first written by Abram Flexner, the founding director of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. And his point of view was that uh, the most innovative, transformative technologies uh, come because there are often a few individuals that against everything are pushing their dream. Like Carrico was pushing the dream of messenger RNA technology. And that you know, comes to fruition, but then has many, many different applications. It's about the long tail of research, the crazy ideas, the high risk, high reward efforts in research that are essentially curiosity driven, possibly with applications in mind, but essentially are a long shot. And I think if we didn't have that technology, the best thing we could do now is build a time machine and create somebody, send somebody back 30 years in the past in order to start that line of research. My own institute had a few wonderful examples. Uh, nuclear uh, technology, essentially, nuclear arms were developed uh, because of the work of uh, Einstein and Oppenheimer. And the first programmable computer was built by John von Neumann, the famous von Neumann architecture. Uh, two interesting facts of that. This was a so-called private, public, philanthropic effort. Uh, it was triple helix before the double helix in biology was discovered. And also quite interesting that uh, von Neumann sent blueprints of his machine around the world for free, which means that my institute let, uh, uh, loses all the patent, the possible patents to that, but that everybody of us has the von Neumann architecture in their computers and iPhones. Now, uh, there's a wonderful example of how technology, again, influences uh, fundamental research. And I'd like to start with the example of superconductivity, uh, discovered by Kameling Onnes in 1911 in Leiden. Uh, actually, the work also where uh, Hendrik Casimir made very important contributions in terms of understanding the theory. Uh, it's the phenomena that uh, basically electricity can flow for free at no energy cost if you cool certain materials at very low temperatures and you can build very strong, in principle, unlimitedly strong magnets. Now, we see these in many applications in uh, magnetic levitation trains, very few of them, unfortunately, uh, in Europe, uh, fMRI scans uh, with tremendous applications on uh, uh, addressing neurological diseases, basically the birth of modern neuroscience, and absolutely crucial also in modern applications like quantum computing. Uh, but actually, the largest applications of superconductivity is in my field, in particle physics. You find it 100 meters on the ground at the Large Hadron Collider in CERN, where actually these superconducting magnets allow the protons to take these huge orbits of 27 kilometers. And the discovery of the Higgs boson, almost 100 years after the discovery of Kamaling illness, is therefore directly related to uh, this, uh, this phenomena. It's not a straight path, it's very circular but there is a logical connection. Now, I think the most important uh, lesson, by the way, of that story is very impressive, is that education is key. When Kameling Onnes started in Leiden, he didn't build a laboratory, he didn't you know, recruit postdocs or students, he started this Leitz Instrumentenmaker School, the, the school to produce instruments with a technology that was several orders of magnitude, more careful, more precise, uh, so he was basically investing in 13-year-old boys uh, in order to make the breakthrough discoveries. Uh, that also meant that for the first basically 10 years of his career, there were very few results. Question is, is a university able to hold its breath for 10 years? Of course, after that, he had a 10-year advantage on everyone. And sometimes I worry that we are, we are, less, we are more hesitant to take these gambles and have that long-term view. Now, I think it's particularly exciting because, in my view, we are going through a tremendous uh, transformation in our science. I like to say we go from building blocks to design. Here you see two cars, two toys, cars, one from metal, one from Lego blocks. If you go back after a few weeks, the left will still be a car, the right might be something completely different. If you know that reality exists out of building blocks, then you can start building. And so I think we're 
we are and have discovered these building blocks. The genes and molecules that are the basic blocks of life, uh, the atoms and particles, electrons that constitute matter, and the codes and algorithms that give information in all three areas. We are witnessing key technologies that allow us to start designing, building from these Lego blocks. Clearly, the genetic editing, CRISPR-Cas technology in biology, uh, my last year the Nobel Prize was awarded, uh, clearly quantum technology, we'll hear more about that in the field of material science, and of course deep learning and AI in artificial intelligence, and we are living through this revolution. I think people in 100 years will look back, well, that's the moment when they went through that transition. Now, in fact, it's even interesting because all these three elements are working together. Perhaps the key technological applications of quantum computers will be to build new molecules that then can be used, for instance, in medicine and large data and AI uh, in order to find the properties of these molecules is another tool. So it's, it's a truly exciting area, and I think you are here at the very frontier of that development. Now, in order to go through this, we, we have to kind of navigate this kind of, uh, these unknown seas. I like these maps, these old maps, where the part of the world was known, and then part of the world was unknown, and these old cartographers didn't dare to leave the map empty. So they put all these sea monsters there, right, which you think that we're very much afraid of. But I think this image of us scientists, engineers, Exploring the unknown, uh, what's out there, where we project dragons, is a vast understatement. Because it's not about what's not known in nature. It's about what we can possibly make. So there's a vastly larger world, which is everything that we can possibly make. The organisms that in four billion years of evolution lived on planet Earth is a completely negligible fraction of everything that's possible. The same about intelligence of materials. And so how are we finding our way in this infinite sea? Now, I think there's lots of needs to do so. As I said, you know, this summer we also saw the impact of uh, extreme weather and climate change. And, and combined with the pandemic, I think the world is looking at us. Uh, how can you steer the world through these kind of crises? And I think what we need is something like a planetary dashboard, right? We have to see, we have to monitor, we have to analyze everything that's happening in our world. And we have to, we need our engineers and scientists to create that better world. And I think the only way we can do this is using partnerships. And there are two partners that I want to mention here in particular. First is industry, the second is society. Now today, again, we're also honoring Hendrik Casimir, uh, of course, he is very dear to my heart, a great one of these generation of young uh, physicists developing quantum mechanics in a time where only a handful of people in the world understood it and were interested in it. Um, also in a world where so globalization started to work, one of my favorite anecdotes is that he went to Copenhagen and he learned Danish and then he came at the Institute of Niels Bohr and everybody was speaking English. And he wrote the first dictionary of broken English, which I can hardly uh, really recommend. <laughs> the universal language of science. Of course, he became director of Philips Nutlab and was an, also the first president of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences when that academy decided to bring the sciences and the humanities together. He was a perfect person to combine these two interests. Now, of course, those golden times, which is really also coming back why we are here, why Eindhoven is so special and this university is so special. In the 1940s and 50s, some of these large companies, like Bell Labs, the AT&T in the United States, Philips and Nutlab, and Philips Research here in Eindhoven, were tremendous power engines of, of science. I think Philips employed more scientists than the universities in the Netherlands together. Bell Lab had nine Nobel Prize winners for research done in the laboratories. The discovery, of course, of the laser and the transistor, but also the cosmic background radiation, proving the existence of the Big Bang. Well, what was special in those years? I think you will probably know more about it, but part of it was, it's not that it was free for all. There was a clear mission. At Bell Labs, there was only one thing that mattered, improved telephone communication. But to do so, researchers had a lot of leeway 
And there was a spirit of collaboration and academic freedom and the opportunities to explore. And I think that was a great good. And it's certainly, I think, you know, Casimir was wonderful in bringing that spirit, the spirit that he had experienced as a young theoretical physicist working with this wonderful group of colleagues in Copenhagen and Leiden and elsewhere uh, to, uh, to industry. And I think that's extremely important. Uh, if you think about quantum mechanics, again, in the 1930s, a handful of people who did it, the famous Knabenphysik, there were very few uh, women doing quantum mechanics, unfortunately. Uh, who was interested in that? And now it's estimated that 30% of our GDP is based on quantum mechanics. Lasers, nanomaterials, of course, the first steps in quantum computing. I like to say 100% of reality is based on quantum mechanics. In fact, it's the technology that nature uses. The fact that I'm standing here, I'm this big machine, and it only, I only operate because I work on quantum theory. That's what holds the world together. That's why you're not, you're, you're, your chairs are not collapsing. Uh, quantum theory holds the world together. And so now we are at the moment where we're actually exploring and using and building our tools, our technology, with the same technology that nature uses itself. It's extremely exciting. The second partner I think we need is society. And there's something interesting happening. Now, we have seen, we just lived through a period where society needed science more than ever. And I said, you know, with all the complaints, etc., science did its job. They delivered much better earlier than expected, than could be expected. Um, but we also see uh, a reaction to this. Uh, people are pushing back. Um, it's not true that society is able to absorb everything that we develop as scientists and technologists and engineers. In fact, what I think is happening is that the difference between where science is and societies is changing. It used to be that science just happened within the walls of laboratories and universities and society was not very much impacted by it. Now, science is literally in my blood. <laughs> the mRNA vaccine is in my blood. Um, so it's, it's becoming fragmented, it's atomized. Bits and pieces of science are everywhere. And it has a much bigger impact on our lives than in previous times. So it's easy to continue that line and think about where will it end. And there is a dystopian view that in the end, science will be everywhere, but it will be so complicated, it will be so technical, that nobody understands what it is, and nobody has a clue. So science will be all-powerful, but be completely invisible and un understood. I think that's something that we have to avoid. We need society to partner with us to develop these technologies, to make sure that people accept these technologies. Also, that people help uh, develop them and encourage us, because there are important moral and ethical decisions that have to be taken. So now, what are the tools that we have to conquer that future? And I feel there are two. I feel that we can't see the future. It's essentially hidden behind uh, a wall, behind a mountain hill. And we have two tools to see this. I think the first of it is our imagination. Now, we have uh, this incredible power to imagine things that aren't here yet. And, um, and clearly, our imagination is limited. And that's one of the parts why it's so fun to be a scientist, that you have these colleagues who are much smarter and much more imaginative, and you can join. Uh, so that's actually our tunnel vision that allows us to look through all these barriers and see something that isn't there. The second, I think, is curiosity, which is this eagerness to climb over the mountain and just see what's there, just make it, produce it, see it for yourself. Now, these two qualities, everybody is born with these at maximum capacity. I feel that sometimes in education, we, we uh, make people forget that they are imaginative and curious. But I think it's like you have these wonderful students here and it's your job to make them even more curious and more imaginative. And I think certainly in a world where probably machines and algorithms will take over many things that are easy to follow, following the rules, actually jumping out of the comfort zone and doing something completely different is a unique human skill that we should develop further. 
So I want to finish, which I feel is the best part of my job. Uh, I don't know if people write to uh, Sinterklaas here, where these postcards end up, uh, but if they write to Albert Einstein, uh, sometimes these messages end on my desk. A few, weeks, a few years ago, I got a message from three lovely Italian girls asking Professor Einstein whether he liked pizza. Uh, but then, uh, two years ago, I think I got this uh, postcard. Uh, uh, I don't know from whom. Uh, it's interesting, on the back side is the Statue of Liberty. To Albert Einstein, I hope you will never stop being curious. Uh, I think that's an incredible message. Uh, it's a message to us all. It's also a message to you, to the Eindhoven University of Technology, so please, although you're 65, never stop being curious. Thank you very much. Take a seat. Thank you very much for that very inspiring keynote. Um, I can confirm I did not send that postcard. <laughs> um, before we get into the discussion with all three of us, just want to ask you very quickly, You've made a convincing case in relation to basic research as a method for delivering significant breakthroughs. You talk about the foundations upon on which we built, for example, the vaccine at the very start of your keynote. But as you mentioned, it also took many years for us to get there. And we at TUE are very much convinced that this is the way things should be done. How do we convince others, like say politicians and society at large, about fundamental research? So maybe it's about maybe convince is even the wrong word. How do we inform them in the correct way in regards to this, in your opinion, Robert? Well, certainly we should celebrate our success. So, uh, again, that's why I mentioned the vaccine, because you know, public people might think it's kind of obvious that we developed this. But then you notice this is, the, this is the basically a kind of breakthrough on the order of magnitude of building an, an atomic bomb, and it has done, you know, uh, under enormous time pressures. Um, so I think we should celebrate more the successes. Uh, explain uh, also the long pathway and that, for instance, this technology was not necessarily developed with corona in mind. It was done, done for very different purposes. Uh, important applications in the future can be cancer. So we should also say, first of all, how did we get here? That's an interesting road. And also, what's next? So if we see we have a new technology that we can then use to address many other diseases, it's a completely new platform. I would like to spend a little more time doing that. I think that's uh, because I feel it's these examples that make the case. And one thing I find interesting is that, um, no, it basically is such, you know, some, some developments take 100 years. One thing we see is actually that these timelines are shrinking. So if you tell people, well, invest in my research and then in a few centuries it will pay off, you know, that's, that's, that's quite something to swallow, yeah. but I think now we can make the case, because everything is accelerating, that it's, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's in years. And so not only will you be able to benefit, but of course, you know, you also, your children and grandchildren will benefit. And so I think you can make the case uh, that uh, investing in fundamental research, which is not that expensive, because it's, you know, it's about a small group of individuals uh, doing deep things. That that is the right way. And, and if anybody who is, knows anything about investments know that you know, you, what you need is an investment portfolio. You need uh, some safe bets, but you need also some kind of crazy bets that yeah. in the end will pay off. And I think people can understand that. It's actually a very sensible strategy to uh, invest in our country. So take the same strategy, the stock market, some people do, put it into scientific innovation and research. I mean, it makes sense when you say it exactly like that. Well, and it's not only giving you money, it's actually giving your life, right? So it's, uh, I would say in the end, the, the consequences are even much more dramatic. Yes. Now, with the two of you here, we have business, we have academia, we have industry, and we have scientific research. And just with the both of you here together, side by side, is this the beginning of a new era, in Ingrid? <laughs> well, I think especially here, the Brainport community, Eindhoven region, has, has been an example of it for, for over a century. That, well, working together, partnering for research and development, and then not only intele intellectual property, but also uh, producing uh, what you've invented. I think, yeah, well, this is the right spot. 
Absolutely. Robert, do you also see it the same way? Yeah, I think you know uh, the Netherlands actually is very well positioned. I must say that you know, uh, I live in the United States and uh, I see very not that many private-public uh, arrangements. And you know, often you have to travel outside the Netherlands to hear your positive things and see. <laughs> uh, people are very, very impressed with the kind of arrangements, institutional arrangements we have. I think we should do more of those. And as I said, you know, in some sense. Uh, these are all kind of almost fake distinctions. And people have said, you know, there is applied research and there is not yet applied research. It's very difficult to prove that a piece of research will never, ever have an application. But as I was saying, you know, honestly, if you think about where at this moment the cutting edge of technology and research is, as I said, it's very much about almost kind of designing with our knowledge, uh, which is something that is perhaps closer to where... Um, industries are. So I think in some sense the gap of current breakthrough technology and where industry is, 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 is shrinking. And it's, I think, remarkable that, um, particularly I think in this region, that if you think about where some of the key research efforts are in these breakthrough technologies, it's, you find it both in industry and in the universities and you know, in this whole ecosystem that's being built around it. So to make all of this happen, whether it's in industry, whether we're talking about fundamental scientific research, and we mentioned it just a few moments ago, what you need is you need investment. You need to be backed. You need to have the funding there in place. How can we convince, for example, I'm going to use that phrase now, hopefully we see one soon, the new government or new <laughs> governments to make that step, to, to really show them that this has to be done because... It's not only thinking about now, but it's thinking about 10 years time, 20, 50 years time. What, what do we need to do to, to make that happen? Well, I think we should all tell them this. So we should share the story. It, I think it's very positive development, very positive trend that, that both, um, both well, local and regional governments and, uh, well, of course, uh, uh, of course universities and uh, also business community, industry, um, is, is telling the same story, that we should step up, uh, and it is both private investments and public in investments, and that, yeah, well, it's, it's really a chance for the Netherlands, especially since also compared to, to other countries, well, our, uh, our, our um, finance of our, of our country is not the problem. Uh, we, we, it, we don't really... Uh, seem to be able to spend over 60% of, uh, uh, I don't know, the English word for staatsschuld, do you? <laughs> National debt. Uh, yes, <laughs> <laughs> thanks. So we, we seem not to be able, how much we are spending, we're not getting to the 60%. So. Well, I can help out if they want to, you know, no problem. So, but, you know? but this, I think it's really, it's a kind of a USP for, for the Netherlands. Um, well, our financial position as a country. So we should really use it and especially use it on research and innovation. And then how, how can we then, you know, it, it's one thing we know it's there, the money's available. How do we make the decision makers, you know, push them over that, that, that imaginary line, that critical line to say, <laughs> yeah, let's get you on that side with us and, and, and let's explore the possibilities. What do you think? Well, um, First of all, I think you should not, it, it, it's absolutely true, as Inkit was saying, that with 2% of uh, GDP, we, we are not at the 3% level, but that's a very abstract argument. So I would uh, you know, put more details to it, as, as we all do when we make the case, because it's, it's about strengthening our economy. It's about strengthening our society. It's about addressing these challenges. It's about you know, creating opportunities for young people. So I would say, well, we want to spend more, but we want to do it in a very directed way. We have ideas about this. And I feel also that, and, and again, perhaps I'm overstating this, but I noticed that in the United States, for instance, people feel, well, this was an exceptional moment. After World War II, uh, the President Roosevelt, during the war even, asked his science advisor, Van Iver Bush, to write a report uh, about how the, the, these products of science can benefit society in peacetime. And he wrote a very influential port, Science, the Endless Frontier, and it led to uh, uh, basically all the modern infrastructure that we know now. 
I think you know, we are in a similar moment. And we need a story not about, well, let's give us a few, a little bit uh, more. But we are really in a different time where we are counting on science and technology in a very fundamental way. It's about our safety, our, our health, the safety of our planet, the safety of our country. And I would love to see politicians make that case, because I think actually this is a moment uh, where uh, you can, uh, I think, uh, will, will a lot of people understand that this is necessary. They see the problems, they know we want to address it. Uh, the scientific community, both in private business and in public universities, stand ready to, uh, to deliver. I couldn't agree with you more, I have to say. Um, very finally, though, I'd just like to ask both of you to maybe have a, a quick message for the Eindhoven University of Technology campus community before we officially launch the new academic year. Ingrid. Oh, yes, well, well, I think your message of imagination and curiosity was uh, very inspiring. And, uh, but what I really wish after one and a half years of uh, not live classes here at university, I especially well, would like to well, invite you to really, really enjoy an academic year, both when you're a professor or when you're a student. Please enjoy that you're going to have your live classes again. Absolutely. Yeah, I want to add to it, Esmeo. Uh, education science is something we do together. It's, it's wonderful that we're not opening the academic year, but I think we're opening a new phase where we can be together again. And you know, I feel as a country, as a world, we have to jump into the deep, but it's much nicer and much easier to jump in the deep if you hold hands. So. Uh, I think that's where we are right now. I think once we are able to all do that and we can get to there, <laughs> then we can truly be unified in the ways that we were previously. Hold elbows. El well, <laughs> elbows, yes, so there will be interlocking elbows, exactly. Uh, thank you for the insightful discussion, Ingrid Tyson and Robert Dykraft. A round of applause, please. Now, our inspiring keynotes are just the first part of the opening of the academic year this year. The second part, well, it's the launch of a brand new institute here at Eindhoven University of Technology. And to find out more about this institute, have a look at this video. We live in the era of information technology. Data is everywhere and everything is data. We want to be connected, and we want things to work faster. Meanwhile, we're in the middle of a global energy crisis. As we grapple with climate change, we need to drastically change how we use energy. And we need to do this before the world we know simply stops. The Eindhoven Hendrik Casimir Institute is aiming to address this enormous challenge through the combination of two eminent research fields. These are the precision and speed of photonics and the mind-blowing magic of quantum technology. Great things are expected from these fields of research. Quantum computers will literally become exponentially fast while using only a fraction of the energy used by current computing technologies. We cannot imagine the possibilities that lay ahead. We can only dream. So let's dream. By measuring with light, we can produce food more efficiently. That can be a great contribution of the Eindhoven Hendrik Casimir Institute to a more sustainable world. Eindhoven has an excellent history in transferring research results to real-world applications. We are already making a difference in integrated photonics here. But now, by bringing together photonics and quantum technology, we can really make the next big step. My dream is to use our quantum computer to solve very hard problems in quantum chemistry, which leads to new discoveries and opens up the road to personalized medicine. I'm proud of this combination of two very strong fields of expertise at this university, quantum and photonics. I'm really looking forward to the discovery of new materials that will help us build future information technologies. 
The synergy between photonics and quantum technology will impact our lives and future society for the better. That much is quite clear. How exactly? When precisely? We can't say for sure. Where? Eindhoven. Where else? At the Eindhoven Hendrik Casimir Institute. There you have the official video announcing the launch of our fourth institute, the Eindhoven Henrik Casimir Institute with a specialization in photonics and quantum technology. Now to officially launch the institute, I'd like to invite on stage our president, Robert Jan Smits, and Gerda Casimir, daughter of Henrik Casimir. Very welcome on stage. Can I ask you just to stand right there? And Robert Jan, just around there. And Robert Dycraft, can I ask you to just go around the chair? I'm just doing a bit of traffic direction here. And there is a black mark just in front of the screen, you should see. Uh, it's just at your feet there. That's it. Perfect. <laughs> that went quite well, I think. Right. Wow. Brand new institute with a great name attached to it. Robert Jan. Can I get your reaction to this brand new institute in addition to the campus? Well, it's a fantastic, I think, brand new initiative, bringing quantum photonics together. And as regards the name, we didn't have to think that long because Hendrik Casimir is, of course, an amazing person who represents the cooperation between industry and academia. He did amazing work at Philips, at the physics lab, was the first president of the Royal Dutch Academy of Sciences. So he is the embodiment of the cooperation between science and industry, which so much is in the DNA of the Brainport region. So it was for us extremely easy to find this name. And actually there was only one name we came up with, and that's the Hendrik Casimir. <laughs> Institute. It's great when things are like that when it comes to a new institute. It's that easy to pick the name and to, to bring in someone of such historical significance in science in the Netherlands. And Gerda, can I ask you for your reaction on behalf of a personal reaction and also on behalf of the Casimir family for this fantastic honor? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I want to say something about my father. Um, he was born in 1909 and not in 19. 101, which was the new slide. <laughs> <laughs> so, slight correction <laughs> there on the old, uh, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> well, he, was, he was definitely a great advocate of fundamental uh, research, fundamental scientific research. Um, he thought that smart minds uh, should have the space to chase world ideas. That's what he wanted. He... Um, wouldn't have, um, well, not everything should have been uh, judged on practical applicabil applicability and social relevance in advance. At the same time, he was um, in favor of cooperation between industry and uh, science, as you mentioned already. And he, um, well, he thought you should do that in the form of extraordinary chairs, for instance, because he thought that um, definitely the uh, staff of the university should keep their independence. That was very important for him. And then he emphasized very much international cooperation. That's also something he was involved in the international uh, physics uh, society. He was involved in the establishment of CERN, which mm. was uh, already uh, mentioned. Um, I think he would have disapproved uh, of the current climate in the university, where numerical criteria are decisive, like age factor and things like that. And which can lead to, well, in some cases, uh, to something that, that status outweighs scientific integrity. He really would have disapproved of that because he thought you should be able to be curious and to do fundamental research. Well, if you want to know more about his ideas and also about the history of physics, I really can re recommend his book, Read Haphazard Reality. It's reissued as e-book last year and available at all 
online bookshops, ballpimp.com and uh, Amazon, etc. And I can really recommend it. If you want to be involved in the Casimir Institute, you should have read it. <laughs> I think that's a requisite to, uh, to be involved and to have read that. I'll, have the, I'll add that to my reading list. Yeah. And, uh, well, we hope as a family, children and grandchildren, that this institute will work in his spirit, meaning scientific curiosity and cooperation between industry and science, but also internationally. Fantastic. Fantastic. Let me just thank on behalf of the university, Gerda and the family Casimir to be with us today and for allowing us to use the name of the father. I think it's worth a big hand. Absolutely. <laughs>totally agree with the, the message of your father that you just uh, uh, issued and I think, you know, I hope that the Institute will live in that spirit. Also, I must say I'm totally amazed that such a beautiful theory as quantum mechanics uh, now is uh, finding shape in this uh, kind of applied uh, technology lab and uh, I like to say sometimes, you know, uh, ideas in science are even smarter than the people who find them. <laughs> And I think this is typically the case. Uh, and so, the, the, again, an example where science is going faster than I, I could imagine. So, uh, good luck to this new institute. Thank you very much. Right, we're going to do this. We're going to do it on uh, as we'd normally do with a launch like this. I'm going to count you down from three to one, and then on one, you're going to press the button, and we're going to officially launch the Eindhoven Henrik Casimir Institute. So, Herd, are you ready? Yeah. Excellent. So let's get ready with the countdown. Three, two, one. The Eindhoven Hendrik Casimir Institute will focus on scalable quantum computing, photonics based communication, and highly precise sensing, addressing great challenges such as solving highly challenging calculations, secure internet with low carbon footprint, and ultimate precision in personalized healthcare and smart manufacturing. Through the combination of our eminent research fields, photonics, and quantum technology. Congratulations to the Eindhoven Hendrik Casimir Institute and Eindhoven University of Technology on this official opening. And there we have it. <laughs> Round of applause gets in ahead of me. There we have it, the official launch of the Eindhoven Henrik Casimir Institute. I'd like to now ask both Robert and Gerda to leave the stage. And once again, a round of applause for both Robert Dijkraft and Gerda Casimir. <laughs> right, on to the next part of the festivities today. And we have a special guest with a special message from a very special company in the Brainport region. Now, this company is unique and it's a world leading company that's constantly pushing the boundaries in relation to chip production technologies, a company that is a key enabler of the continuous worldwide increase in computing power and data storage. So please join me in welcoming the VP of research at ASML, Frank Skurmans. Very Thank good to you. have you here, Frank. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Really, it's an honorable, just a very honorable moment to be here. I really like uh, to have the moment to speak a few minutes on behalf of ASML, which is actually a long-term partner of this university. So, having said that, it's obvious on all that has been shared so far that technology and more technology and understanding is actually key to solving our critical issues or critical challenges in the society of today. And I can manage them all and will forget half of them, so I won't. But it's really important to realize that you can do this not only with industry, you have to do this together with universities. So for us, being a partner of this university feels like an honor. It really is. 
So to give you a little bit of a feeling on why this is so important to us to work with universities, I have a short video to, to explain what's going on and how we feel that your excellence is in the end our excellence. As we're going into more and more cutting edge technology, going towards the, the future of lithography, we're developing new systems here that are something that's never been done in the world before. And so we need every type of engineer and really intelligent ones with really smart innovation. I'm really amazed what I saw here. I never expected that the level of science which was done here. Well, the challenges that we have um, are not in textbooks. The pace is high, so we need to really be fast at getting to the solutions. PhD comes with a lot of ability to get to the difficult stuff quicker. I think ASML has impeccable technology. The things that you wouldn't think is in, it's possible, but then it, it is possible. So as you can hear, it's going beyond textbooks, it's really doing the on-hands experiment, it's really tangible, and it's what it's about in this company and for what makes us tick. At the same time, it's, a, it's the same for this university. So in many ways you can say, we are a university like a company, so some people at ASML see we are a factory with a university, where we have of course a factory to produce our tools, and the university then is our R&D department that cranks up many research papers as well. You are a university with a factory. And in fact, the board of this university came to us with a request for help. Can you help us a little bit on basically improving our factory? And we gladly said yes. So it's really a pleasure to announce that we today actually giving a gift to this university that helps improving the factory and thereby improving our connection with this university even further so that you can do the testing, the working, the manufacturing, also on this side. And that's why we have a small gift, which should not have been gone, but let's go. Somebody push the button for this university. And I hope you really can make it to use for the best of all your students. And uh, I congratulate you with the opening of this institute, the Herbert Hendrik Casimir Institute. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Frank. Thank you very much for those great words. And of course, these fantastic gifts that we see on stage. So Frank, could I ask you to just come over here and maybe stand just at this black uh, dot here. And what I need to do now is I need to invite somebody else up on stage. We saw him earlier on in the official launch video for the new institute, the Eindhoven Henrik Casimir Institute. So please join me in welcoming on stage Professor Martijn Heck. Martijn, you're very welcome. I'd ask you to just stand at this black marker here where you are, roughly, that's it. And Robert Jan, can I bring you around Martijn and get you to step at this, just a marker just there. There we are, more <laughs> traffic management in progress. Um, right, well, I see you have something here, very, yeah. very nice. So we thought we'd better bring a small gift. Well, a token I'd, appreciation. Absolutely, so I'd ask you now to present this to Martijn Heck on behalf of ASML to the University and the Institutes. Excellent. <laughs> Fantastic. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a po we're going to do a pose here. We're all going to look out there. There's a camera out there somewhere. Um, we're going to pretend we find it. So we're all going to do a kind of a, a look out there and smile, and then we'll we'll kind of then relax afterwards <laughs> about the, the awkwardness of it all. Okay. So okay. let's look out. I see the camera. We'll go three, two, one. Cheese. Go with the English on it. Three, two, one. There we go. And then we'll do another one where we're all having a bit of a joke about how awkward that all was, right? I guess, yeah, yeah. you know, it's always yeah. a bit weird when that happens, okay? <laughs> um, Robert Jan, the reaction on behalf of the university. Well, it's an extremely generous gift, Frank, mm -hmm. and we are extremely grateful as university for this gift. It will allow our scientists in this institute to extend the frontiers of knowledge, and it also will allow our students to get trained to the best technology. But more often, this gift shows the partnership and the friendship between ASML and the Eindhoven University of Technology. A partnership which has grown over the years and which continues to grow in the future. So once again, extremely grateful. And the only thing I can say to you is a big hand. Thank you. 
Thank you for those words as well, Robert Jan. So, right, I think we have done with a very nice presentation. Thank you, Frank, coming You're here on behalf of ASML. A round of applause for our current guests on stage, and they can now leave stage. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're on to the final part of today's festivities. And after that fantastic announcement from ASML with so many great gifts, um, well, we're going to have to top it. And we are going to top it because we have the formal opening of the academic year. But before all of that can take place, we're going to have a few words from someone who is critically important to the university. And I'd like you all to please give a very warm welcome to our Rector Magnificus, Frank Byens. <laughs> You're very welcome to the stage, Frank. What's my black dot? Well, you, you don't have a black dot yet. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I was, I was really happy to hear that 65 is the new 40, which means that I have quite a few years of uh, curiosity ahead of us. And I really also appreciate the partnership that we have uh, with ASML and all the other companies uh, in the region. I think it's really important that, that we have that situation. It's also very fitting with uh, what I would like to discuss uh, today with you. Um, now it should work, right? Forward. That's not my presentation. No. Yes. Ah, there it is. So, a new academic year, and I thought, well, let's have a new logo for the university. No, of course not. <laughs> but uh, this is a symbol of the subject that I would like to discuss uh, today, and that is the power of collaboration, which I think is a unique asset of this university and very fitting with the ambitions that we have in education, research and impact. But before I do so, I would like to go back a year and a half in time. At that point in time, we suddenly had to close the university and basically make an overnight shift to online teaching and working from home. And ever since uh, that day, we have been adapting to the intricacies of this uh, pandemic and today, is no exception to that. And it's really remarkable to see that, despite all the uncertainties, anxiety, a huge amount of work that have gone into that, the measurable output of this university has not been affected. The average number of credits that our students acquire has not changed. And that also holds for our scientific output, as well as the scientific input, the research input that we have which I think, uh, given the, the circumstances that we have, is a really remarkable result. But it's only half of the story. Colleagues have fallen critically ill. We've lost family and friends. We see a sharp decrease in student well-being and a sharp increase in the number of colleagues that are suffering with long-term health issues. Many of us had to work under difficult circumstances, juggling between work, and personal life. And I can only imagine how difficult it must be to start an academic career under these circumstances. But today we take an important step forward, a step towards being an on-campus university again. And we basically can resume all our on-campus education and research. And I'm really excited to see our students back on campus, as well as uh, those who are directly involved in education and research. Others we have to ask to be a bit more patient and continue to work from home for the time being. But in this time of crisis, there's also a lot that he has learned. And there are many examples of that. But I would like to mention two that have kind of like personally struck me. The first is, it's very hard to beat the on-campus experience. And the We've, had, we've been through this very steep learning curve in terms of online teaching. But the result is that we now have a much better university-wide understanding of what does and what does not work. And I think that's very valuable information in terms of the long-term objective that we have, that is to offer more blended learning opportunities to our students. Now, blended learning would make our courses more flexible and less restricted in time and space. And I've seen one particular course that last year was transitioned completely in this uh, blended learning format. And this course is to this year offered every quarter throughout the year. 
without increasing the total workload. I think that's an impressive result, and the students really appreciate it. So I would like to capitalize on this type of experience that we've had last year and to see how we can move forward with our um, education. The second example is early on in this crisis, we were able to form hybrid teams, teams of faculty, teams of support staff and students, addressing very specific uh, challenges. One of those challenges was to take online examinations in a safe way. And proctored examination was the solution to that. Now, we had high quality expertise available within ASA and ICMS, two of our services. And we were able to basically involve all people and to align them in the decision making that was following next, and also the implementation. The result of that was that we had a relatively smooth implementation of proctored examination. It was quickly adopted by faculty and students alike and has really helped us to prevent unnecessary study delays for our students. Now, this, this way of collaborating, this can-do mentality, is something that we really should retain for the future. Now, we've just uh, launched uh, a new institute, the fourth institute, the Hendrik Casimir Institute, and it's focusing on quantum and photonics systems. And I would like to stress this word, systems. Because that's the common denominator that we have between the four research institutes that we have today. Complex molecular systems, artificial intelligence systems, renewable energy systems, and today, quantum and photonics systems. Now, in these complicated systems, you can recognize a certain hierarchy of, of, of a number of levels. And at each of these levels, we have to perform very basic fundamental research. To give you an example, we can work on new materials, but also have to look at systems architecture and also how, understand how these systems interact with society, what the impact could be of these systems on society. So this systems thinking is quickly developing into a core strength of this university. And it fits exceptionally well with the Brainport region, a region that excels in high-tech systems. Now, it's part of a, a longer-term effort to increase the research strength of our university. And that's essentially based upon three pillars. The first is to offer scientific independence to faculty. No hierarchy. If we're making this transition into an investigator-driven model, we really have to commit to it. After all, scientific talent doesn't want to work for someone. They would rather like to collaborate with their colleagues and create their own niche. The second is, we cannot excel at everything. We have to create critical mass in selected areas. So that's why we've asked departments to focus on, say, three, four domains in which they think that they can excel. In these domains, you can form collaborative teams of scientists, having a shared vision, share the infrastructure, take shared responsibilities in education. And there are really outstanding examples thereof within the university, true pockets of excellence. And actually, I would like to thank uh, Robert Dijkgraaf and also Bert Meijer in the audience for the initiative that they've taken for sector plan beta and technique, because this plan has really helped us to accelerate implementation of these ideas. And the third, this is what the Institute is all about, we would like to foster cross disciplinary research. A lot of the exciting research that we see today is happening at the interface between disciplines. It's really when scientists come together, when they exchange ideas, explore new territory, that the magic happens. And I personally had the privilege to be in such a situation a number of times. And it's an absolute thrill if that happens. Now, this approach to our research has to tie in with the recognition of the reward system that we have. And it's now two years ago that I introduced the initiative that we have on a national scale, on recognition of rewards. And there are three important components to it. It's providing room for talent, encourage collaboration, and put quality first in everything that we do, 
always quality before quantity. Now, we formed our own recognition and reward committee, and they have uh, formulated six leading principles. We discussed them broadly within the university, a number of dialogue sessions, we had very valuable feedback, and we actually refined and sharpened these uh, leading principles. We're now at the stage that we would like to take the next step and think about the implementation. And for that, we have assembled a new task force, essentially composed of members of the, what we call interdepartmental committees, as well as the Eindhoven Young Academy of Engineering. At the end of the day, it's about their future. Um, now, there's a, a lively discussion about this topic within the university and outside of the university. And I would like to address uh, three issues today. The first is, we work from a culture of trust and appreciation. It's very important that we set realistic objectives and goals fitting with the competences and ambitions of the individual. We must also acknowledge that not every career path will develop in the same way. The speed at which careers develop will be different. The endpoints may also be different. Not everyone will become a full professor. But it's absolutely essential that we acknowledge and appreciate the professional contribution that everyone makes, irrespective of role or function. The second is also pretty fundamental, I think. We're a university. So all faculty are involved in research and education. You cannot bail out on one of them. Now, in a recent survey among faculty, it was also clear that many feel that uh, the educational performance does not have sufficient uh, weight in the way we assess people. So we have to address that. One step that we're going to take is to explore more education-dominated research profiles without, and while retaining this requirement that people are active in research and education. And third is, and quite often asked, how do you measure excellence? We don't. Sure, we can count publications, and we can count citations, and we can look at journal relevance and support. But how do you measure research culture? How do you measure leadership? How do you measure academic citizenship? How do you measure whether or not the research is really innovative? And so forth. So I think that a, there are useful metrics that we can use as indicators. But a metrics-only driven system is bound to fail. It actually may provide uh, with inappropriate incentives to individuals. Because I'm, we need a more integral, rounded way of looking at people. After all, it's not just the level that has been achieved, but it's also the way that level has been achieved. That's important. I know of only one way to do that, and that's peer review. So we will continue to do that. Um, because culture is such an important component in what we do, it almost automatically ties in with the next subject, which is social safety. Academia can flourish in an environment of trust, appreciation, and openness. If people feel well, the university does well. But it's unfortunately clear from a recent survey that not everyone at our university experiences a, a safe work and a learning environment. And we have to address that. Now, this September, actually September 20th, we'll start a campaign um, creating awareness that social safety is a top priority of the university. But more importantly, it's a responsibility of all of us. Sure, we take a number of steps like increasing the number of uh, confidentiality person, there will be an ombudsperson, and we will refine and sharpen our procedures. But it's not about procedures. It's about the culture. We have to treat each other with dignity, respect, and integrity. And if you experience any form of transgressive behavior, act. Don't be a passive bystander. Speak up. Now, it's time for some exercise. So maybe you could no. squat. Squat is the acronym for support quality drive. 
Services and support is an integral and essential part of our university. And departments and services should seamlessly collaborate. Pretty much like Swiss clockwork. However, in a number of areas, we see that a gap is emerging between the departments and the services. We somehow have lost this intuitive way of understanding what we need and what, need and what we can do. So the purpose of uh, the Scott program is to rethink how we organize our support. To improve the quality, to make it more people-centric, to make it more effective, but also more efficient, and to close this gap. And the most effective way to close a gap is by moving the two ends. It's a shared responsibility. We need to reconnect people. We need to restore partnerships. And I think Squad in itself is a unique opportunity to make that change. And if we can get it right, we will all benefit from it. Now, I haven't talked much about, say, buildings and labs and equipment. Very important for a university. But I've talked about people. Because people make the university. It's about the students that we educate and train. It's about the scientists that are pushing for the next scientific breakthrough. It's about professional support staff without whom the university would not run. People are the heart and soul of our university. And a unique asset, I think, of this university is the fact that we can collaborate, both internal and external, national and international, is really part of our DNA. And I honestly feel that if we can pair scientific and professional excellence with this power, this ability to collaborate, that we can really stand out as a university and live up to the ambitions that we have in education, research, and impact. Thank you very much, and I wish you a wonderful new academic year. On campus. Well, thank you, Rector, for those very inspiring words to give us the formal keynote to open the academic year. But you know we're not done yet. Okay. You know that, don't you? Yeah, yeah. You know what's happening here. So we have one more thing to do, that, that red button, right. which has been subject to cleaning as, as regards to Perfect. COVID protocols. Just want to point that out to everyone who's wandering here in the room and at home. So, Rice, um, We've been, we've been down this road before. We've done this. Yep, we yeah. did this last year. Yep. So I'm going to ask you, Rector, to take your position sure. behind the red button. And we're going to do a countdown from three. And on one, we press the button. And we formally open the academic year <laughs> for everyone today. Are you ready? I am. You are ready. Three, two, one. Thank you very much to the Rector for officially opening the academic year here at the Eindhoven University of Technology for 2021-2022. We are done. We are officially open for business for this new academic year. Now, before we finish, just want to point out one thing. The cortege will be leaving the room. Can everyone please stay seated during this? And as the cortege leaves, please wear your masks as well. I'd like to point that out. I'd like to give out some thank yous on behalf of the university and the board. First of all, thank you to our inspiring keynote speakers, to Ingrid Tyson, who's sitting here in front of me, and to Robert Dijkraaf. A round of applause once again for our keynote speakers. Also, thank you very much to the Casimir family for being here for the launch of the Eindhoven Henrik Casimir Institute. A round of applause as well, please. And finally, thank you very much to ASML and the VP of Research, Frank Skurmans, for being here with the announcement of some fantastic gifts for the community. And of course, some of those will go to great use across the campus and with the new institute. So a round of applause as well for ASML and Frank. 
So as, I've, as I have said, we are officially open for business for the academic year 2021-2022. And in this, our lustrum year with the theme Heroes Like You, let's be sure that we continue to be heroic, we continue to be positive, and we continue to be there for each other. I've been your host, Barry Fitzgerald. This has been the opening of the academic year 2021-2022 at the Eindhoven University of Technology. And until we see you again, stay safe and stay healthy.